Well, um, welcome everyone. It's, uh, we have uh, quite a number of participants there, which um, uh, because this is a webinar format, we, we can't see everyone, but I just want to welcome you all to this second session, which is focused on indigenous stewardship issues and decolonial approaches. And I want to first, um, before I say anything else, just acknowledge the First Nations owners. In Australia, commonly before we begin sessions of any kind, we acknowledge um, the first owners who are the Turbul and Yogara people in Brisbane, where I'm currently located and broadcasting. And they're the owners of the lands where QUT stands. And we, I wanna pay my respects to their elders, their laws, their customs and creation spirits. And I want to particularly acknowledge that these lands that we're broadcasting or I'm broadcasting from have always been places of teaching, research and learning. So welcome everyone to this afternoon session. I have to admit, um, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to chair this incredible session of very diverse uh, group of academics from around the world. And also what I understand is a really significant uh, a collection of participants who are listening to this webinar format. But my congratulations go to the Center for Environmental Law and Nenya and your team and others who've organized what I think is a really vibrant and rich and thought provoking uh, program over the next few days. Um, and I'm really looking forward to participating in that. So just, uh, just as an administrative note, um, the chat room is currently open and there's a lot of notes in there that I have no idea what they're saying. Um, they're not in English and I don't understand. So I apologize if I don't can't respond to some of the things. I, I only speak a couple of languages, but one of them is not the current, the conversation going on. Ben, uh, I'm impressed the conversation with Otto in particular, I'm referring to here. So we're, we're moving a little bit away from giving uh, the Q and A uh, button on the, on the right. You can use both that and the chat room uh, to have conversations. Um, I just put a note in there for the speakers that if you, while you're speaking, don't worry about the chat room. Uh, if there's something of importance there, I'll bring it to your attention uh, afterwards because you don't want to get distracted by conversations in chat. Um, uh, thanks, Beth. <laughs> But it's, a, it's Dutch between Otto and Ben. Um, just as I know, so for the speakers, um, Ninja, I'm not sure what format you adopted in the morning and I apologize for not being there, but I might give the speakers a chance to speak between 10 and 15 minutes and then leave questions to the end, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, I will limit my introductions very briefly um, because the booklet is really well done. It's comprehensive in terms of the speakers uh, and their background, and we'll get into the conversation here uh, this afternoon. So I can't think of a topic more significant, I think for me, in terms of biodiversity, than un better understanding um, the different ways in which we can think about the world around us. And, and for so long, indigenous, metaphysics, cosmologies, and ways of coming to terms with the world um, were really uh, put aside in favor of other forces like capitalism and, and rationality and other ways in which um, we, we sought to develop the world around us. But I think we're seeing a real significant and timely resurgence in more and more discussions and scholarships, not just of indigenous stewardship, but also a more sincere attempt at decolonizing the law and understanding that so much of international law and so many domestic systems are actually symptomatic of a particular way of thinking about the world around us. And so this is a really, um, a, a session devoted to helping us think more about these particular issues and particularly as to how they can help us think more about uh, our relationship to the natural world and biodiversity and protection of it in particular. So with that, we'll begin our, our panel. And I again, welcome you all, particularly those of you who've come in the last couple of minutes to this afternoon session. It's so nice to see a really large and vibrant group of speakers and participants. So given 
that I have such a difficult surname. I, I, I apologize to my speakers if I don't pronounce yours either. I should be probably more used to paying more attention to that. Um, but I'm Afshin Akta Kavari, and I'm a professor at the QUT uh, Law School, where I've been for four years. And my research so far has been around understanding science, metaphysics, and ecological theory. And I've applied myself to things like uh, restoration, issues of extinction, and a host of other uh, concerns that bring the human nature relationship into a conversation with what we're doing. And our first speaker today um, is Jonathan Lilibad, if I've said that correctly. Um, Jonathan, you're a senior lecturer at the ANU College of Law, and your research interests are in the intersections of human rights, indigenous rights, the environment, and rule of law. And I've heard Jonathan a number of times speaking about human rights and indigenous issues, and it's a real pleasure, Jonathan, to be able to hear and listen to you again. So over to you, Jonathan. I'll interrupt you uh, about 12 minutes and then we'll finish off at 15 if you still continue. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for, for, yep, thanks for that, Afshin, and um, thanks for everyone uh, for coming today. Let me just uh, share my screen and make sure that everyone can um, see. Uh, whoops, here. Oh, here we go, okay. All right, um, so uh, hopefully everyone can hear me, no problems. Um, if there's an issue, just uh, please include a message in the chat box. Um, just as a positionality statement, um, I'll also acknowledge country. And so for those of us here at the ANU campus, it's the uh, land of the Ngunnawal and Hanbury peoples. And we uh, pay respects to the elders uh, past and present, um, as well as the ongoing claims of sovereignty. Uh, for me personally, um, I should note that um, a number of years ago, I found out that I was, uh, my family was part of an indigenous peoples uh, from Myanmar, uh, specifically uh, the Pao. And um, it was something that uh, my family had not acknowledged for quite a number of years. And it was something that I sort of had to return to. And so I've sort of been on this journey to sort of rediscover those particular kinds of components uh, of identity but then also to sort of acknowledge um, the legacies of indigeneity um, and colonization uh, for a lot of the current events that we see playing out um, in the world around us at this time. I'm not gonna go into the, the reading out, uh, you know, this, um, this abstract or, you know, there's a lot of content on the slides here, um, but I'm not gonna go into those. I'm, I'm, I'm rather focusing on some of the broad general outlines of the, of the project uh, that I'm engaged in at the moment. Uh, normally my work is largely empirical. I usually do a lot of field work in Myanmar and, and the rest of Southeast Asia regarding the nature of indigenous rights, um, uh, human rights discourses and, and claims to environmental resources, um, which are rather prevalent in, in the region. Um, but for the purpose of today, I, presentation, my presentation is much more doctrinal. And basically what occurred was as I was thinking through a lot of the issues, it occurred to me that there needed to be uh, clarification regarding some of the doctrinal developments that have occurred with respect to indigenous rights in recent years. And so, you know, my concern very much is about uh, what is the place of indigenous perspectives within legal discourses, particularly international legal discourses regarding um, environmental law and uh, human rights law. Um, Within the international environmental uh, legal discourses, I think most of you in the audience are already familiar that there have been a number of efforts uh, to allocate space for indigenous concerns. And so on the screen here, um, I just present some examples of different spaces where there's been an effort to integrate indigenous perspectives. And so for today, particularly this workshop, there's a convention on biological diversity which very much uh, makes an explicit uh, statement about the need to include knowledge and practices of indigenous peoples um, uh, within notions of uh, biodiversity and uh, biodiversity conservation. One of the things I've noted though, um, is that concurrent to a lot of the efforts in international environmental law, there's also been a concurrent effort within international human rights to link up with environmental issues. And so uh, we see this reflected in efforts such as the Special Rapporteur on Environment and Human Rights. And as those of you who are members of the IUCN, there's also been efforts by the International Union for Conservation of Nature 
to try and connect uh, human rights with the environment. Um, within this entire discourse, um, there has been some reference to indigenous peoples and indigenous rights uh, within human rights discourse. And so specifically here, um, I'm just presenting a summary of um, a framework set of principles articulated by the Human Rights Council from 2018. And uh, there were two principles in particular that caught my attention. So principles 15 and 16, 15 that acknowledged uh, the need uh, for human rights concerns to address uh, obligations to indigenous peoples. And then principle 16, that uh, those human rights concerns also uh, connect to questions of environmental damage and sustainability. So in my mind, um, what the question that arose is, as much as there has been in recent years an effort by international environmental law to address the indigenous right to environment, can we now start to try and construct an international human rights approach to the, to the topic of indigenous rights to environment? Um, if we're going to engage in this kind of a doctrinal discussion, there are two components. Uh, first is about uh, substantive rights. So what are the substantive, substantive rights that are available? Um, and then what are the procedural rights uh, that are relevant and these kinds of things? So that's in the red there at the bottom of the, of the screen. So what I've been doing um, at this stage of the project is addressing or trying to map out um, the substance of international human rights law that addresses these substantive and procedural components. Um, and effectively what I'm saying is that, um, or the, the logic here is that, uh, that when we're dealing with indigenous concerns. A lot of it is derived or tied to ecosystem services, um, particularly that with indigenous uh, communities, there, there's, a, there's very much a need for subsistence there's also a need uh, to pursue a certain standard of living. Um, there's, of course, the questions of life and health. Um, but then, uh, in addition, specifically for Indigenous peoples, there's also this concern about Indigenous culture. And so that these are the kinds of things that Indigenous communities need uh, from ecosystem services. So in which case, uh, what is it that is in international human rights law that deals with these kinds of ecosystem services? So it becomes a mapping exercise to go through international human rights instruments and to identify the provisions that deal or protect uh, these kinds of ecosystem services. Uh, for purposes of demonstration for today, um, I'm just presenting uh, you know, the provisions that I found within UN DRIP, uh, as well as the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, so the ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or the ICESCR. And so you see that. Um, that there's this process of going through the human rights treaties and picking out the provisions that relate to each of these ecosystem services that are relevant uh, for indigenous uh, communities. Antecedent to the question of substantive rights is, there's the, is the question of procedural rights. And so by this, uh, what we mean is that uh, indigenous peoples uh, need access uh, to legal institutions uh, to claim some kind of a remedy. Not only do they need access to remedies, they also need to establish a certain amount of personality. And so for purposes of the courts, it's gonna be a form of legal personality. So the question then becomes, then what are the rights that deal with procedure regarding uh, access to remedy? And then what are the rights, procedural rights that deal with legal personality? And again, um, are these protected or enshrined within international human rights instruments? So once again, it's a mapping exercise to go through and identify um, what provisions of international human rights treaties provide uh, procedural rights regarding access to remedy and procedural rights regarding uh, legal personality. So what I've done here is um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that there, you know, there's the rights to equality, rights to information, rights to free expression, right to free association, right to participate in public decisions. So these are the rights that uh, ensure that uh, indigenous peoples are able to engage uh, legal procedures for remedies. And then on the right-hand side, I've identified provisions um, in the ICCPR, the ICESCR, and then in addition, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, that deal with these particular uh, kinds of procedural questions. There's also the questions of legal personality. So here it's about uh, for, for groups of people like indigenous communities, we're talking about collective identity. Um, 
Critical is the right to self-determination. In addition, uh, there's very much this question about consent or free prior informed consent. And so once again, um, I've, I've been identifying the provisions in international treaties that uh, provide these. One of the things I'll note uh, between the previous slide and this one is that um, you know, within uh, international law, as you're probably aware, there is a distinction between resolutions, declarations versus uh, conventions. So the things like declarations are non-binding, whereas with conventions are binding provisions. So in terms of protecting indigenous peoples or indigenous uh, concerns, uh, there's very much uh, preference to try and find provisions within conventions rather than sort of the uh, soft law declarations. Now, why do we go through this entire exercise? You know, the so what question. Um, and there are a number of reasons uh, why um, there is some uh, value in working through the international human rights system um, to try and identify an indigenous right to environment. One is that um, international environmental law is uh, largely dealing with state to state concerns, you know, so state violations, uh, duties to other states. Um, international human rights, uh, in contrast, uh, provide spaces for non-state actors, so individuals as well as uh, groups of people. So therefore, it provides a little bit more flexibility for uh, indigenous communities to uh, seek some kind of protection through international law. Um, there's also facilitates a greater connection between nature and culture. So as much as there's a nature culture discourse within inter international environmental law, uh, it's also possible to, to support it with the international human rights discourse regarding uh, nature cultural linkages. The other thing is that uh, by opening up access or the util utilization of the international human rights discourse, we then also open up additional avenues uh, to advance uh, legal claims by indigenous uh, peoples. We also open up indigenous access to international human rights institutions uh, to address uh, uh, concerns. And then we're also facilitating um, a greater access to a greater number of international institutions uh, to address indigenous concerns. Now, this is to this does not deny that there are continuing issues, and so this is something um, that I'm continuing to work with in, in, in the project is to deal with this question about the nature of indigenous legal personality. Um, you know, for many indigenous peoples. There's ongoing tensions about the notion of sovereignty. Is self-determination enough or is, 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 is full sovereignty desired, particularly when a Westphalian international system? Um, what's the differences between hard law versus soft law uh, instruments in terms of being able to address indigenous grievances? Um, there's also, uh, particularly dealing with international law, uh, there's very much a need to recognize what's the state party status. So as much as we recognize the availability of rights within international law, we have to understand if the states have uh, committed themselves as, as state parties to different international treaties. And then more importantly, we have to pay attention to the level or the amount of state implementation of their obligations to international treaties. And so this is where we start to deal with some of the empirical uh, uh, concerns. And so this is something that I think as once we go post COVID, and particularly for those of us in Australia, we're allowed to resume international travel. Um, it would very much be, uh, be feasible to then pursue some empirical studies to deal with these uh, questions. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there since it's, this is sort of a useful stopping point and we're getting close to the end of my time, um, but I welcome any kinds of questions or comments or feedback. So uh, thank you. Jonathan, thank you for that. Um, so for our participants, the chat room is open for you to uh, post comments, questions at any time you like. And there's also the Q&A section if you could uh, post questions specifically if it's addressed to a speaker, particular speaker, if you could just note that down. Jonathan, I'm going to ask that we uh, respond to questions and actually have a dialogue after all the speakers have finished. So we might pause at that point, but just say thank you for, I think, opening us up to realizing that uh, international law uh, is both a barrier, but also can empower and support how indigenous communities really interact with um, their land, but help us learn more about that interaction with nature. And I think uh, figuring out how to empower them through international law is critical. So your 
presentation has really brought out these doctrines and concepts that can really enliven that debate. So thank you very much for that, Jonathan. That's great. Um, really nice to hear you speak to that. Um, we'll next go to Maria Antonia Tigre, um, who's a di director of the Latin American Global Network for the Study of Human Rights and Environment. Um, you're also the coordinator, Maria, of a human rights group in particular, um, which deals with, uh, which is part of a global pandemic network, looking at uh, issues around pandemics and ecological rights. And I understand you're also currently finishing your SJD at uh, Pace University. So I'm assuming you're coming to us from uh, New York or somewhere. I I'm not sure, but maybe you can let us yeah. know. It's a pleasure to meet you and over to you to uh, talk to us about lessons from nature in terms of living in harmony uh, in a post-pandemic world. Right. Thank you. Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, from Brazil originally, but I've been in New York for uh, quite some time now and it's midnight over uh, after midnight here. So please bear with me as I <laughs> go through this. I also have two little kids who usually wake me up at 6 a.m. So. Um, we'll go light yeah. on you when it comes to questions then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's a, really a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you so much for having me and participating in this wonderful discussion on biodiversity and present a little bit of a perspective from, uh, from Latin America. Um, the focus of my presentation really involves a couple of different topics that I have uh, been working on recently, which... Uh, I think really highlight how we need a holistic response to the multiple global environmental crises that we're now face. So climate uh, pollution, biodiversity, and I think now the COVID-19 pandemic comes out as the sort of fourth uh, environmental crisis given the, the zoonotic uh, orange origins of the pandemic and the environmental effects that it ha has also had. Um, so I'm bringing together a bunch of different uh, different types of research here, but I think it, it, it sort of fits nicely uh, together. So the, the first point that I wanted to talk about is um, COVID-19 and indigenous groups and biodiversity. And obviously COVID-19 has had impacts on all aspects of lives and livelihoods and these impacts have been felt quite dramatically in Latin America and the Caribbean where I'm from. Uh, where pre-existing gaps in social economic equality and already strained health infrastructure has sort of laid the foundation for significant harms uh, from COVID-19 and the responses to it. And as a zoonotic disease, biodiversity protection is really at the core of any type of response to address this pandemic and prevent future ones. So I think it's become increasingly clear how environmental concerns are really deeply interwoven with the pandemic and amid the devastation caused by COVID-19 to obviously lives all around the world, there has been this increasing awareness of the importance of a healthy environment in combating the disease and preventing future outbreaks as well. And we have faced a scenario of uh, increasing deforestation, forest fires and biodiversity loss that have resulted from measures taken in response to the pandemic. This is particularly true in the Amazon region where I do, if I focus a lot of my work in that region and um, lockdown has really led to reduced enforcement and government monitoring, which allowed these activities to thrive, unfortunately. And these activities along with the lack of protection from the government have allowed COVID-19 to spread to indigenous communities. And um, there's actually a, an article that was published recently by uh, John Knox, the former Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment and Victoria Tully Kirkpoo, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, but the prior Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, peoples um, noting the role of indigenous communities in uh, the global biodiversity framework to be adopted in October by the COP uh, of the CBD. And, they argue that the best way to protect nature is really to protect uh, the human rights of those who live there as the remaining natural ecosystems are largely found on the lands uh, of indigenous people. So uh, this is basically the, the underlying thesis that I also focus on, but uh, 
the issue is that still the assault on indigenous peoples and their lands have increased even more during the pandemic. So I think we have an opportunity now to reflect on, on the nature society relationship and to analyze how the constant pressure on the limited resources we have uh, remaining on the planet has led to, this led to this natural crisis, facilitating the spread of new viruses that were once controlled by natural bar barriers that are no longer there as strong as before. And, um, and this uh, has really informed the, the, this work that I've been doing for the Global Pandemic Network. And uh, we sort of did a deep dive into the ecological rights that have been infringed uh, during the pandemic as sort of this uh, exercise into thinking how we can develop, uh, we can come out of it uh, towards uh, sort of a green recovery uh, but also prevent future ones. And, and the timing of this discussion is particularly critical if we think about um, from a Latin American perspective, because there's a string of cases from the inter-American human rights system and some national courts in which the right to a healthy environment and associated rights of indigenous communities to preserve their lands and natural resources have come to the forefront. So adopting a stronger rights to indigenous territory in tandem with a right to a healthy environment could really help secure indigenous rights as protected in the inter-American uh, system. Um, so uh, this all, all brings me to, to the human rights aspect of all of this. And given the effects that environmental degradation has on human rights uh, and the effects that COVID-19 has uh, on human rights, it's essential that these responses are grounded on human rights, including the rights to a healthy environment. And obviously the right to a healthy environment has been adopted in, in several countries throughout the world, but there's, we still lack a, sort of a comprehensive international instrument that recognizes it. Um, but there's a growing push in that direction. It's been gaining traction in the international forum uh, in the past few years. And COVID-19 perhaps might be the missing link to ignite this recognition by means of underscoring the gaps in our legal in our legal framework. Um, I think it's unfortunately that uh, throughout a, a lot of the international negotiations that I have been following, uh, there's still not a lot of mention to to COVID nineteen as sort of this fire that I'm talking about here. It's usually mentioned as uh, an excuse to not commit to more because of the economical constraints that it has had on several countries. So it hopefully, we'll see some change in that as well. So um, the interdependence of the right to a healthy environment and the enjoyment of other human rights have been really highlighted during this pandemic with special emphasis on the rights of indigenous communities. Uh, obviously the rights to health, life and collective property are among those particularly affected by COVID-19 and its consequences ranging from increased deforestation, biodiversity loss to land invasions and conflicts that have prompted contact with non-Indigenous peoples as well. Um, so considering the role of Indigenous communities in biodiversity protection, I argue that we need to go uh, even beyond recognizing the rights to a healthy environment and expand rights to nature, uh, grounded in this concept of harmony with nature that um, Indigenous groups have developed in Latin America and beyond. Uh, and this, uh, this part, it, it's basically focused on uh, uh, grounded on this very long research that I have been doing on um, sort of the philosophical and uh, ideologies that that uh, are shared uh, around like really globally uh, in terms of their religious traditions and the cosmovisions of indigenous groups um, on on the duty that we have to take care of the environment and the rights of healthy environment itself so Obviously, part of this, like I said, it's focused on indigenous peoples and um, which have traditionally promoted this ideology that embraces nature, nature purely and um, holding this basic knowledge that we as humans are just a part of nature and we have this role as caretakers of nature as well. Uh, and the, the interactions of indigenous peoples with the environment represents a significant basis of their religious practices. Land, for example, in most indigenous cultures really represents um, a living entity. Uh, in the, uh, the Inca civilization refers to earth as Pachamama. 
it's translated as mother, uh, earth mother. And this meaning is not metaphorical. It, it really means that everything is alive and mother earth should be cared for, cared for. And, uh, and while these traditions are often ancient, there's a currently, there's currently a call for renewing these indigenous cosmovisions to protect our degraded environment. And they have shared this ethical wisdom to address some of our time's most pressing ecological problems, including water scarcity and biodiversity loss, which we're talking about here. So integral to these revitalization efforts is an understanding that people and place and nature and culture biodiversity and cultural diversity are all inextricably linked and must be addressed together and holistically. So we are now debating the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, uh, plus a new political declaration to strengthen the implementation of international environmental law, which was called for by the, by the UN General Assembly. So by next year, we could really have two significant new international legal agreements that could shape our responses to the global the global environmental crisis in the coming years and, and shape our sort of our post pandemic world. And I think it's essential that I think most people really want to forget that the pandemic ever existed and go back to normal, but we really should consider the effects and the causes and the consequences of the pandemic in uh, in everything that we do, including the biodiversity crisis and learn from this harmony with nature concept from indigenous groups as these new documents are negotiated. So we can't afford to miss this opportunity and ignore the lessons from, from these challenges that we face, which were already significant even before the pandemic and are now even more so. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, I'm happy to, to discuss any of these points uh, in the Q&A. Fabulous, uh, thank you, Maria. I think, um... You know, it could be more timely, I guess, in terms of the discussions around the, the utility of what is really a, a cosmologically significant idea of harmony with nature and bringing that into a conversation around how indigenous people can really contribute to better understanding pandemic issues. I, that's fantastic. Thank you for articulating that so clearly at, at midnight your time. Um, Maria, again, we'll come, we'll come to questions um, uh, at the end. Um, there's questions appearing in both the chat room, but also the Q&A, which I think only I can see. Nen Yang, is that right? Uh, yes, and I'm not too sure, but yes, uh, okay. I can see as well, but uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think uh, as moderators, we, we can see that. If, if you do ask a question in the Q&A panel, do you mind um, uh, putting your name to it? Because it's I, I, at the moment, there's someone with ZYXD1 yeah, it might be useful just to have a name to call you. So, I, Maria, thank you for that. Um, and I hope you'll be okay to stay for questions given how late it is for you. And we really appreciate that you've joined us um, and uh, presented. So we're gonna go to our um, next set of speakers uh, with, and, and you'll have, I'll have to apologize if I don't get the names right. So maybe you can correct me, but uh, Belen uh, Pedregal and Pamela, Gele. Um, Belen, you're a professor of human geography uh, at the University of Seville in Spain. Um, you seem to have collaborated in a really large range of national and international projects relating to population migration, uh, water management, environmental justice, and spatial planning. And I think you're currently working on some really interesting projects, including one that's uh, looking at mapping water conflicts in Andalusia uh, in particular. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this session and I assume you're uh, speaking to us from Spain, but you're also co-presenting with Pamela, who's also an anthropologist um, and currently working on a PhD in land use planning and sustainable development. Uh, you're a member of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and also the Social Science Working Group of the Society for Conservation Biology. Um, interestingly, you belong to the Women in Conservation Group for Latin America and a Caribbean network uh, that participates in the uh, urban Mapuche community. Um, so welcome to you both uh, and thank you for joining us and over to you. You've got uh, 15 minutes in total 
to present um, your paper, which is about the North-South di North Dialogue on Territorial Policies and Narratives. And you're drawing on um, insights from new strategies for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Greetings from Seville, Spain. It is very early in the morning and still dark because we, we are in summer and we have daylight until 10 30 so at mm -hmm. night so it's it's quite a different this is a challenge for organizer i congratulate you because you have done a great job and it's very difficult with so many time zones and pamela she's uh, one or two in the morning so that's why we have prepared a presentation to help us out to translate all our results it's very interesting because uh, we have analyzed European perspective and Latin American emerging approaches that are related uh, to what Maria Antonia has presented before. So I think this is a very good session and I hope you, we can translate you all our results that we believe it's very interesting. Allow me to share my screen and my presentation, our presentation, sorry. I don't know, is that okay if I play it now? Do you see my... Yeah, it's perfect, yeah. Okay, now I play it because we pre-recorded. I hope this works. It's 30 minutes and I think we summarized pretty well what we want to say, so I hope it works. First of all, we would like to start by thanking organizers for inviting us to present our work on North-South Dialogue on Territorial Policies and Narratives. This work is a joint project that Pamela de Hell initiated when she came to the University of Seville to study Spanish conservation policies in connection with the Spanish special plans. At the time, she was finishing her PhD dissertation on land use planning as a counter hegemonic tool for nature conservation in Latin America with particular focus on the Argentina case study. So we began our North-South dialogue that has a starting point, as you can see in this picture, the threat of nature conservation policies, and ended up addressing the broader goal of territorial policies and narratives. In fact, we began this dialogue first focusing on governance and public participation issues comparing the role of environmental and territorial defenders, discussing about the gender perspective and the leading role of women in Latin America. But finally, we decided to zoom out and get a broader view of conservation policies considering the framework of territorial policies and narratives in both continents. So we initiated that work with the following starting questions. What territorial narratives and paradigms are the most advanced? See, taking into account the framework of the transformative pathways to living in harmony with nature. What can we learn from each other? Our objective was to confront narratives, put them into dialogue, and try to provide some insights for new strategies towards the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. To accomplish this objective, we selected the European Union and Latin American cases studies, deep literature and policy documents review, as well as text analysis. And also set some criteria for comparison, like describing the historical backgrounds and identifying the visions and concepts on territory and nature. Concerning the European territorial perspectives, we analyzed the European Special Planning Policy documents produced from 1999 onwards. These documents define special planning as a strategic approach for an improved spatial coherence of community policies. That means, and this is important to understand these documents, Spatial planning is not an European competency, but provides policy guidelines for improving spatial coherence of community policies on several levels. Horizontally, across policy sectors, 
vertically between different levels of government, including national, regional, and local level, and also between public and private sector. And finally, geographically across administrative boundaries, known as the transnational and cross-border cooperation. You'll see at the bottom of this slide the European documents that we have analyzed, starting with the European Spatial Development Perspective, published in 1999, followed by the European Territorial Agendas produced in the last two decades. From here, we start presenting our main results and conclusions. Obviously, given the short time we have, this is just a very brief summary. If you would like further details, please feel free to contact or to read the paper that is following this presentation. Although some developments and differences can be identified from the first European policy document to the last one, in this slide, we try to summarize main results on their territorial perspective. The context for this document is the constant ongoing process of the construction of a, a European Economic and Monetary Union that means reducing the inequalities between the various regions. In this context, regional disparities are seen as barriers to the European integration and spatial planning as a means to achieve it. In order to accomplish this integration, territorial policies pursue a network and borderless small-scale Europe, which can maximally capitalize on its territorial potential. And especially in the last decade, they also promote what they call territorial cohesion in order to achieve an inclusive, smart, and sustainable Europe of diverse regions. Concerning the concept of territory and nature, following this idea of integration, the European territory is seen as a polycentric organism, which consists of nodes and connecting corridors. Translated into the conservation policies, they envision a community-wide ecological network of protected areas. For its part, nature is seen as a services provider, and directly related to quality of human life. Literally, they claim protection regulations and development restrictions should not be allowed to have a negative impact on the living conditions of the population. And finally, diversity of territories is seen as an asset and a potential for development. Now we are going to move from north to south. As you can see on the left, Latin American history is defined by colonialism, the structuration of indigenous and Afro descendant peoples, and a new political position against foreign interests. One of the most worrying consequences of this is a current scenario of extractivism, which has harmful environmental and social impacts. What we mean by extractivism is a large scale exploitation of primary resources, usually for export, such as mega mining, monoculture, or deforestation. On the right, we can see the responses to this context. Like many social movements led by indigenous people, Afro descendants, and women. Also, strong critical thinking was developed with ideas like Saturn epistemologies and post development. In short, these approaches seek to decolonize knowledge and make it useful to social struggle with territorial goals different to its development. So, from this critical thinking emerged the two approaches that we're going to talk about today. As we mentioned before, we will just highlight the most relevant points. The first approach is good living a mix of ideas from the indigenous Zambian nations. Its general goal is to recover communitary life in harmony with nature. It means coexistence, not domination. The main points to highlight are, first, nature is a subject and has rights. It means that nature and humanity are a political community. Second, knowledge, 
the same poster signs and rationality. Finally, the third theme to highlight from this approach is that territorial autonomy is essential to achieve good living. It means that territory has a decolonial sense of persistence and social transformation. The second emerging approach we wanted to tell you about is territorial settlement. It joins the voice of women across the continent that look for guaranteeing the circularity of life by caring for the nexus of body, land, territory. That takes us to the following idea. First, there is a corresponding relationship between violence against natives and violence against women. Second, the understanding of the body as a territory and the territory as a body. The follow affirmation summarizes this approach. When the places we inhabit are violated, our bodies are negatively affected. When our bodies are negatively affected, the places we inhabit are violated. One example of this thinking applied specifically to nature conservation is a collective agenda of the network Women in Conservation from Latin America and the Caribbean. You are able to take a look at this in the web page you can see down left. So after going through these European and Latin American territorial approaches and narratives, we could identify some main difference between them. Again, highlighting just main results. The first thing is that while the European approaches are concerned about promoting territorial cohesion and achieving a balanced and sustainable development, the Latin American ones are mainly concerned about autonomy, integrity, and defense of the territories against foreign interests. Second, while well, in the European policy documents, justice means equitable distribution of benefits and opportunities. In Latin American perspective, justice means territorial autonomy and redressing of historical injustice. Sir, well, in the left, nature is understood as a service provider. In the right, nature is conceived as a subject with its own rights. In this sense, well, on the left hand side of the slide, Nature degradation means se severe risk to ecosystem and quality of life. On the right, nature degradation means different kind of violence, like physical, emotional, psychological, gender, and ethnic. Finally, well, on the left, territory and its diversity are understood as an asset for potential development on the right, territory has a decolonial sense of community identity and resistance. Finally, from this North-South dialogue on territorial narratives, we are able to outline some insights for new strategies toward the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. First, prioritize and expand social, environmental, and territorial justice concepts. Second, articulate conservation policies with territorial cohesion and spatial planning. Third, recognize nature as a subject of rights. Fourth, judge nature degradation as violence. Fifth, visualize conservation as body family care. And sixth, promote transdisciplinarity and emphasize social science role and alternative knowledge. We would like to finish our presentation saying that we strongly encourage more North-South dialogues for looking at the bigger picture and be more critical. Thank you very much for your attention. Bella and Pamela, thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you also for being up so late. Pamela, I didn't realize it's between around 2 a.m. for you. So thank you. And Bella, thank you also. It's late for you. 
And thank um, you very much. <laughs> what a what a fascinating way to highlight. Um, I think, you know, the differences between the north and south, and to really get us thinking hard about the benefits of thinking from a decolonial perspective. Um, and look forward to a bit more discussion at question time. Thank you so much to both of you for that. Um, we'll go to our last speaker, and Otto, um, over to you uh, to speak to us about global solidarity. Um, Otto, you're Prince, Professor of International Law at Wuhan University in China and the Institute of Boundary and Ocean Studies. Uh, you're also a uh, professor with the Research Institute of Environmental Law and a founding member of the International Water Law Academy at that particular institute. And you're a managing editor of the Chinese University of Environmental Law. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you and to have a chance to hear you speak about um, global solidarity as a general principle that we can use to think a bit more about um, marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So over to you for um, 10, 15 minutes. And can I also encourage you to ask any questions you have of any of our speakers in the Q&A box? There's already three questions there that I'll um, come to. And if it's easier for you to put things in the chat room, then go ahead. Um, over to you, Otto. Thank you for being here and for uh, presenting to us today. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, allowing me to present. Uh, actually, here it's uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, which is a very convenient time. So I feel a little bit responsible towards the other speakers who are presenting at very awkward moments uh, in the middle of the night. Um, so for me, it's not a, a big uh, sacrifice to speak to you at all. It's actually a great pleasure. Um, so I wanted to speak about global solidarity as a general principle applicable to the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, so BBNJ. Um, so, uh, sorry, the world is currently reaching a, the final stages of decade-long negotiations leading, hopefully, to a new agreement under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, on the conservation of uh, this biological diversity, uh, BBNJ. So this new treaty is needed because the current regime that seeks to protect marine biological diversity on the high seas is highly fragmented. So firstly, some marine protected areas do exist. And indeed, in the opening panel of this morning, uh, Cassandra Books uh, introduced us to the uh, Ross Sea MPA in the Antarctic. Uh, that was established in 2017. Um, but there is no coherence. Uh, I mean, there's no coherence in the MPAs established. Uh, some are established, but others are not. And it seems to depend more on political will rather than on the application of sound scientific criteria and models. And also uh, the rules that are applicable differ from MPA to MPA. So we saw, uh, we heard uh, Liu's presentation on uh, research fishing, and that might, might mean different things in different MPAs. Second, some migratory marine species are protected by a special treaty regime like whales, but others are not. And third, the few generally applicable uh, obligations that do exist are so vague, I think of part 12 of the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, that states have no idea what exactly is expected of them. And fourth, some marine activities seem entirely unregulated, such as the use of marine genetic resources taken from high sea species. So there's thus an urgent need to address the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity on the high seas in a more holistic way and agree on a total package of rules and, and regulations relating to marine genetic resources uh, establishment and management of MPAs on the high seas, environmental impact assessments, as well as capacity building and transfer of marine technology. But tomorrow's session will be devoted entirely to BBNJ. So in my brief remarks, I propose to focus on my topic, uh, global solidarity, and analyze the actual and potential role of global solidarity as a general principle applicable to the conservation and sustainable use of high seas marine biological diversity. 
and also look at the central role of the United Nations in promoting and implementing this principle in this particular context. So first I propose to say a few words about the concept of global solidarity and then uh, give a brief overview, or I might skip this, of the drafting process of the new BBNJ treaty. And then I will look at the latest draft of that agreement um, and see if there is room for references to global solidarity in it. So first I will say a few words about uh, global solidarity and the role of the United Nations in promoting it. Uh, so the United Nations, as we all know, huh, it was established in 1945, basically to avoid a third world war. So it was based on the solidarity of the United Nations in their fight against the Axis power, so a common enemy. At the time of its founding, many delegates uh, reminded the world of the importance of lasting global solidarity as laying the foundations for the long-term success of this organization. So in 1945, the most formidable common challenge was, of course, to avoid a new world war. But already at the San Francisco conference, um, where the UN was established, many delegates expressed uh, the wish that the same global solidarity should guide the world also in times of peace in the fight against uh, emerging and unexpected evils. For example, uh, Ezequiel Padilla, who was then the uh, foreign minister of Mexico, um, yeah, he, held in, uh, he spoke to the conference as follows, and now I want to quote, in this UN charter are gathered all the hopes for human solidarity. Henceforth, no nation needs any longer be isolated in silence and darkness in the indifference or the complicity of the rest of the world. We are now met at the Forum of Universal Conscience." End of quote. Um, and there's many other uh, such quotations that I really enjoy um, discovering uh, and, and sharing with you. For example, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Belgium, um, he spoke the following words, and I quote again, Everybody is now stressing the necessary solidarity that ought to manifest itself in times of war. And one is right, of course, in doing so. But this solidarity would probably become useless if the peoples of the world understood more clearly that they must also help another in times of peace." End of quote. So let me now fast forward to present times. In present times, we need to help one another to fight common evils such as diseases of mass destruction, viruses, think of COVID-19, the adverse effects of climate change, but also marine biodiversity loss. So at the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, many state representatives stressed the importance of global solidarity in the fight against the coronavirus. For example, in his remarks at the high-level meeting, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the president of the People's Republic of China, he stated the following, and again, this is a quote, major changes unseen in a century are taking place in our world. The sudden attack of COVID-19 is a grave test for the entire world. Mankind has entered a new era of interconnectedness which country, with countries sharing intertwined interests and their future closely linked together. And thus the UN must promote cooperation. To promote cooperation among countries is a founding mission of the UN and an important purpose spelled out in the UN Charter." End of quote. So global solidarity is crucial in our fight against this new evil, the coronavirus, but it is and will be equally crucial in our efforts to alleviate poverty, to combat climate change, to protect and preserve marine biodiversity, and build an environmentally sustainable future for ourselves, for future generations, and for nature itself. All that is required is to make effective use of the extraordinary opportunities provided by transnational cooperation. And the United Nations, in my view at least, provides the best suitable global forum for discussions on how to move forward. So, in this uh, new agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity uh, beyond areas of national jurisdiction, 
that we have an opportunity to again add some references to global solidarity or similar uh, language. Um, so these measures to conserve marine biodiversity as agreed upon in this new treaty with negotiated within the UN framework um, will, in my view, need to be just as drastic, ambitious and comprehensive as those presently taken to beat the virus. So before I discuss references to international cooperation in the most recent draft of this new treaty, um, I will give a brief overview of its negotiating history up to the present day. But I realize that um, tomorrow morning, well, we will talk a lot about BBNJ, so I can be very brief. And you've got four minutes. Exactly. So um, there are these different stages. Have first a working group was established, and then a prepcom was um, established, and now we are at the intergovernmental level. And uh, the document I wanted to focus on is the uh, revised draft uh, of 18 November 2019, which was published by uh, Rina Lee. Uh, the uh, uh, president of the Intergovernmental Conference. She's from Singapore. Um, so she published a revised draft text of this agreement. Uh, and this uh, text will hopefully become sort of the uh, central point of the last round of negotiations. So in this revised draft of November 2019, do we find references to solidarity? Well, let me already give you the answer. No, there's not a single reference to solidarity in it, but we do find some references to international cooperation that I think are worth mentioning. And so article two of the draft actually states as the general objective of this new agreement to further international cooperation and coordination. And this is further detailed in article six, which provides some further details on how this cooperation, international cooperation should take shape and manifest itself. Uh, basically, there's this idea that um, we should cooperate to establish new global, regional and sectoral bodies uh, where these are missing at the moment. And also interesting is Article 48 about the Conference of the Parties and the obligations of this Conference of the Parties. And uh, there's a interesting reference in paragraph four uh, sub C uh, about the obligation to promote cooperation and so on. And it's actually quite detailed in uh, how this cooperation should take shape. Um, so then you may wonder, and I only need one more minute, um, what is the difference then between international cooperation and international solidarity? I mean, Aren't these references to international cooperation uh, good enough? Well, I would argue that there is a big difference. Um, so the difference between cooperation and solidarity, in my view, is that the latter refers especially to the most vulnerable within the international community. So indeed, if you look at the history, you find that the term solidarity is most often invoked by the UN General Assembly to underline our common responsibility to protect those most vulnerable or most affected among us. And there's a lot of examples of, of declarations referring to solidarity uh, with rural women, uh, with um, people living in poverty, uh, solidarity with the people of Africa in their continuing struggle against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance, uh, solidarity with the plight of children, uh, and so on. And most recently, in a resolution on the global fight against Corona, the General Assembly called upon the international community, regional and international organizations, and relevant stakeholders to give high priority to people, particularly elder women and girls, and areas that are most vulnerable, particularly developing and least developed countries. So. Uh, we do see many calls to pay particular attention to the most vulnerable in this world. Um, so that's a crucial aspect to what we refer to as global solidarity. And if you apply this to the protection of marine biodiversity, we could consider an expression of solidarity with nature itself as being particularly vulnerable. 
or elements of nature that are particularly vulnerable. And Article 27 comes quite close eh, as it refers to areas identified as ecologically or biologically significant or vulnerable, and for that reason uh, requiring special protection or special attention. So if we want uh, to be very progressive and revolutionary, this would be one way uh, to think about global solidarity. I thank you for your kind attention and look forward to any questions you may have. Well, thank you uh, very much for that presentation. I think it's really interesting um, that differentiation between solidarity and cooperation not only helps us think harder about the human dimension, obviously, but as you've illustrated, um, it helps us think more about the uh, areas in the deep seabed and areas of the ocean that we want to protect more. And so that, that relationship between the concept and doctrine and the areas of protection uh, bring out some really interesting dialogues uh, for us to take into account. Thank you for, uh, very much for that, Aga. Um, so we have um, uh, about 25 minutes to um, engage in questions. And if I may, I might begin with a couple of questions that uh, is directed at everyone in the panel, and I'll leave it to you to decide uh, if you want to answer it. But we might, if, if it's to the whole panel, we might just go in the order that um, you spoke at and decide whether you want to say something. Um, and then I've got two questions that are a bit more targeted to uh, specific individuals, speakers here, and I'll see what else comes up. Uh, for those of you who've joined us somewhere in between this presentation, as I see the number of participants has been growing, uh, we can either take questions in the chat room or in the Q&A button that's just to the right on your panel. The first question um, from Michelle Lim, the critical importance of decolonization and the elevation of indigenous peoples and knowledges is increasingly recognized. And similar calls to achieve global solidarity have been seen as an ideal of the global community, for example, the UN Charter. And just so you know, Otto, this question came before you began speaking. <laughs> So here's Michelle's question. However, given the power differentials and the interests of those that benefit from the status quo, what are some of the ways in which we might overcome this challenge to achieve a world where we live in harmony with each other and with nature? And the question is to all of you, if you, um, you know, want, want to explore it. So if you want as a speaker to discuss it, just go off mute and, um, Respond. So, Michelle's question is in terms of power differentials and the interests of those who benefit from status quo. How do we deal more with these uh, issues of decolonization and elevating indigenous people uh, and their knowledge system? And what are some of the ways in which we might overcome these challenges, given you know what you've said? So, over to you, if you want to respond. I can. I can start. I guess. Um... Thanks, Maria. So obviously, it's, 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 this is a very good question. And I think uh, it's our goal as, you know, scholars to think about those big issues and see how we can best respond to those. Um, I wanted to mention in response to that, actually, an example now from Latin America, we, the, the region has recently adopted the ESCASU agreement, which is an, an agreement on procedural environmental rights. Um, that has been, uh, it was negotiated for about six years and uh, it just entered into force after 11 ratifications. And it's been a long ongoing process. And I think it sort of um, exemplifies a little bit from a regional perspective, how we can achieve that because it's considered a very progressive agreement it's focused on environmental rights, procedural environmental rights. and. Um, the whole way in which that agreement came about was very um like they they actually embodied this idea of broad participation and involved uh, uh, different stakeholders and um 
indigenous voices and geos you know really bringing the perspective from uh, from different voices and not only you know like states and the global north like obviously it's not from the global north but bringing that towards a global perspective that example um I think it's really interesting to see how that, you know, eventually became a progressive instrument that hopefully will will be effectively implemented in the region. So I think procedural environmental rights is definitely part of that of, of that answer. Thanks, Maria. Can I also say something? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, don't, I might just quickly just see if Jonathan, and then we'll go in turn to the where you were in the order. So Jonathan, did you want to respond and then? Um, yeah, I just, well, it's just a quick comment about, you know, so much of um, colonization uh, before, you know, because, we've, you know, before we start talking about decolonization, we have to understand why there was colonization. Um, it was sort of a reflection of this Westphalian system that arose from 1648 and it was, was very much tied to sort of the state uh, note this notion of sovereignty and state sovereignty. Um, and so the process of decolonization is very much about um, going beyond the state centric uh, world. Um, and as much as, you know, it's as very much what Maria had in indicated is to facilitate the inclusion of a lot of these voices that have been uh, excluded uh, for the past several centuries. Um, this extends the discussion we had this morning about a rules-based order, you know, international rules-based order. But the question is then the rules, the new rules-based order has to facilitate um, these alternative voices, right? You know, these non-state voices. And so it's a question as to who's benefiting from these new rules-based order. Um, and so this is very much a question of addressing issues of equity, um, you know, empowering those who were not involved uh, in the discourses before. My concern, though, um, is that there's a question of fundamental question of trust. For a lot of indigenous peoples, for a lot of the third world, there's not a lot of trust in engaging with entities that have never fulfilled the promises they made in the past. So why bother, you know, in other words, why sign a treaty with some entity like a state that has violated every treaty that they made with you and over the previous centuries? And I think this is a legacy that's going to take quite some time to overcome. Um, so I'll just leave it, my response at that. That's great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Bella, no, Pamela, I think you wanted to come in and then Otto, over to you after that. Okay. I agree with what uh, has been said, but I would add something else. I, I agree that uh, many voices and more stakeholders have to participate in decisions and in the way we protect resources and, and so on. But I think uh, the whole society has to change, especially in Europe, the way we see things. That's why we focus on, in, in my research group, we are very focused on what we call the narratives, the paradigms, the perspective, because it's very important. I provide you one example. Here in the south of Spain, agricultural uses of water are very important. And this is a very important uh, activity. And there is this idea that, that is still on in the, in the news and everything that every water that rivers uh, run to the sea is wasted. So we have to take all the water for agricultural purposes. Otherwise, it's wasted. It's wasted. They don't think in, in the ecosystem and the services they are providing to other <laughs> other species and so on. So it's a, it's a matter of all the society have to change the way we have uh, this view and, uh, and the way we relate, of course. And then there is this uh, asymmetry of power as uh, Professor, uh, 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 or the question was mentioning, no? the, the asymmetry of power. And we are living in this neoliberalism that is taking all the countries and is privatizing and international corporations have more power than governments. And we have to, again, put the focus on commonalities, on commonalities and solidarity. I, I agree with the professor's speaker. 
Um, well, I think this is the two things I wanted to point out. Perspective, paradigms, the way we see things, because still we have a lot of way to go. And the other thing is about commonalities, um, governments against international cooperation, and this is uh, quite a long way to, to walk. Thank mm. you. That's great. Thanks, Bella. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to respond quickly to Michelle Lim's uh, question, because there's actually a lot of references to indigenous peoples in the uh, draft of November 2019. And what I find very uh, refreshing is that references to indigenous peoples are not uh, references to particularly vulnerable group that needs special protection, but they're actually about the uh, the, the contributions that indigenous people can bring. And so they have special knowledge about uh, certain areas of the, uh, the world or the ocean that require special protection. They have knowledge about how best to do it and so on. And so all these references to indigenous peoples, they're actually about what valuable contributions they can bring to the fore. And they don't regard them as vulnerable people that we need to protect and so on so i find that really interesting yeah thank you very much to you all uh, really solid uh, answers to a, an interesting question um from michelle um i'm going to now go to a couple of questions that i think uh, are somehow link and i just want to acknowledge also that some of the participants um are here at particularly odd and late hours of the day. So thank you for uh, hanging on and um, part, you know being here with us. Thank you very much. Just, there's a note from someone who's logging out because it's quite late, including, I guess, for our speakers. So thank you. There's a question from Ben Bohr and also one from Judith Preston. I, I'm just going to try and combine. Um, and I, uh, one is to all of you. The other one is to Jonathan and Maria. But it's, the questions are the links between indigenous people's human rights and environmental rights is clearly brought out in the increasing recognition of the plight of environmental human rights defenders around the world. So human rights defenders around the world, including Latin America and across Asia, in terms of how they're being intimidated, harassed, and the violence, physical violence that they experience. The question from Ben is how best to assist in reducing the occurrence of these attacks. From Judith, and I'm, I'm just sharing both these questions and, and then I open it up again to the panel to see who wants to address them, particularly uh, Jonathan and Maria for that one there. Judith's question is, what are some of the most effective and practical ways that vulnerable communities, particularly environmental and human rights defenders can use from the international legal framework to protect their environments, including cultural heritage. So most effective and practical ways that vulnerable communities uh, can draw and use instruments to use to protect the environment and cultural heritage. So over to, um, again, we'll go in the order and see who wants to respond. Thank you. Um. I can just I can provide an answer I think that addresses both uh, Ben and Judith. Um, you know my take is this is where we start to tie into the questions about rule of law, um, and you know I, I know we've the IUCN has a discourse about environmental rule of law, um, but for me it's just rule of law just in general. Um, to say that there is some system of rules within uh, not just internationally but within states that facilitate um, the exercise of rights. Um, because you know, there's been a lot of effort to articulate rights. Um, and even within authoritarian regimes, you see that they have these statements of rights, but yet um, they're never implemented or enforced. Um, and so the question is then, how do we promote rule of law? And this is where we get to start having cross-issue linkages in terms of diplomacy, foreign policy, um, multilateral, uh, uh, international uh, in, uh, dialogues. And so I think that this becomes a much larger uh, project um, and which hence the reason why I think that it's very critical um, to have these conversations. And of course, the question then is when we say rule of law, 
we're talking about um, the thick definitions of rule of law where the legal system exists to protect the rights of uh, minorities, the rights of individuals, to hold uh, those in power accountable. So it's rule of law uh, for everyone. It's not rule by law. Um, and so this is something that it's uh, an ongoing uh, discourse that has to be connected. So. Thanks, Jonathan. Right. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to the ASCA2 agreement uh, once again to, to answer these, these two questions. Um, I think, well, the ASCA2 agreement, first of all, it was it's the first agreement that uh, specifically recognizes the rights of environmental and land defenders. So uh, in addition to all of the procedural environmental rights that it recognizes, which are obviously essential to their plight as well, because obviously access to justice, public participation, ensuring all of those procedural rights, um, ensures that they can actually do their jobs and, and help us protect the environment. They, there's also this specific provision that addresses uh, the rights of environmental and land defenders, um, in addition to obviously the whole uh, international framework that protects human rights defenders as well, but this specifically relates to environmental defenders. Uh, and indigenous, indigenous peoples are obviously, uh, especially in Latin America, one of the main uh, people that are affected by by these ongoing threats. So obviously the, the agreement itself, it's not the, the only solution. There needs to be implementation uh, throughout the whole region to actually make, make it worthwhile and make what, what's in there um, you know, effective. But that's definitely a big significant step to, to actually uh, ensuring that their rights are respected. And, and obviously it's a, that's a very big uh, issue in Latin America, as, as a lot of the countries in Latin America are high on the list of uh, of deaths and threats to environmental and land defenders. Um, so I guess we'll we'll see if it, if it's going to be effective uh, in a couple of years. Um, but uh, sort of picking up a little bit on what Jonathan was talking about in terms of the the second question, I think because uh, it obviously relates to this issue of rule of law, but also I think uh, I keep going back to this issue of ensuring the enforcement of the, the, the laws that we already have, right? So uh, in, in most of those countries, there's, there's a very significant legal framework that already protects indigenous groups and, and land rights specifically. So I always think that ensuring their lands, right, land rights, you would can ensure that they actually, you know, that most of their other rights are respected as well. Um, and that also reflects on, on environmental protection too, as uh, there have been a lot of studies that show how uh, giving indigenous peoples their, the right to their lands actually ensures that, the, that that land is uh, protected from an environmental perspective too. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. Any of the other speakers want to speak to that question? Um, all right, I, I have um, a couple of questions here. Uh, Jonathan, they're, they're specific to you. Um, one is in relation to the rights of indigenous people to genetic resources. Um, question is, what's the scope of that right based on their traditional knowledge, especially uh, normally, they don't have traditional knowledge on genetic resources, the right to it, but rather the species itself with particular genetic resources. There's a subsequent question also from um, Yin Yin Win, who's from Myanmar, and she's also asking a question related to that, which is, uh, and to you specifically, Jonathan, in relation to the rights of indigenous property, especially for land reuse rights. Uh, which could not be protected. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on, on those? So they're open questions, Jonathan, if you wanna um, respond. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks um, for those questions and thanks uh, to the audience for all the other questions as well. Um, so I can respond to both questions with the same uh, answer. Uh, when we're talking about uh, traditional knowledge or genetic resources, you know, this is relating to the uh, Nagoya Protocol um, in real, you know, and the Nagoya Pro 
protocol to the CBD. Um, and then we're talking about uh, indigenous land rights. You know, this is where we have these discussions about customary tenure. Um, and this is something that's been very much raised by uh, instruments like uh, UN DRIP. Um, but to me, they both reflect an underlying issue about the nature of uh, legal pluralism, uh, particularly you know, the existence of multiple uh, orders of rules uh, held by different communities, different peoples, different cultures, and the question about being able to provide space for the exercise of those rules, those rules relating to the treatment of land, the treatment of, uh, of a species, uh, whether plant or animal, flora, fauna. Um, and I think that this is something that um, is very much uh, problematic for a lot of uh, states uh, in the world. There's, there's this ongoing issue about uh, recognition of legal pluralism and the accommodation of legal pluralism. And I think that this is a, very much a project that has to continue going forward. Um, the other issue um, that I will note is that um, from the international law perspective, um, you know, there have been these calls for engagement uh, to create state-based uh, systems to address and provide um, some level of legal pluralism. And so particularly with the Nagoya Protocol, it's the states that fashion these clearinghouse mechanisms um, to provide uh, means of connections between uh, multilateral corporations and uh, local indigenous communities. But the issue there, as something I alluded to earlier in the previous answer, is that for many indigenous communities, it's very difficult to engage these kinds of mechanisms because you're, you're asking them to participate and work with parties that are responsible for exploitation of the resources. You're asking them to work with parties that have never followed through on any kinds of commitments or promises regarding rights, sovereignty, self-determination, consent, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an issue of um, building trust and then going beyond trust, having verification. Um, so I think that this is the next stage that has to occur uh, to further these kinds of mechanisms. Now, whether that occurs at an international level or, or a state level or a sub-state level um, outside of uh, two non-state actors, sorry, um, I think this is an open question that um, deserves further exploration. So thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so, so two more questions uh, before we wrap up. So one, uh, Otto, to you. Global solidarity has strong underpinnings as a moral value and vague principle, but a relatively weak legal principle. What could be the add-ins for BBNJ? Why is it particularly important to incorporate this principle into uh, BBNJ? And another question to Bellen and Pamela in relation to the assumption in your presentation that regions have coherent and unified narratives. How do you come to terms with the fact that within uh, Latin America and even the EU narratives that you've tried to bring together have many different iterations and versions of it? And how do you account for that within regions? In other words, there's an assumption of unity and sim simplicity between those two regions. Um, do you mind accounting for how you might have dealt with that in your uh, presentation? So we've got about three minutes left. So um, I'll go to you, Otto, and then see if Ellen or Pamela want to respond to that last question. Okay. Well, um, I was trying to make the point that uh, the United Nations has since 1945 uh, identified uh, common evils uh, and then has tried to bring the world together to uh, find a solution to those evils. And I was then making the argument that uh, this um, loss of marine biodiversity is one of these evils. So I don't think that um, global solidarity is particularly important when it comes to BBNJ. It's also important in the fight against the coronavirus, in preventing a third world war and so on. Huh? So I was just making the argument that this is just the next global challenge and thus uh, we have to uh, display global solidarity if we, as we have been called upon to do in the fight against all these other evils. And of course, I'm not um, naive. Huh? So I realize that there is talk and then there's action uh, but uh, I wanted to focus on the talk. 
in my presentation and not on the action. Fabulous, thank you. Okay, so concerning a question, this is very interesting because what we try to explain is that from the beginning of the construction of the European common market, that is the single market and you know this European Union, they always have this purpose of um, uh, fighting against the inequality in development between the different regions. So they dedicated funds, um, they dedicated a lot of resources in order to equal um, this principle of equal these regions and, and the different levels they have uh, concerning the, the social and economic development. So this is the principle of the European Union from the beginning. So they promote in this special planning the idea of uh, territorial coherence. That means that all the regions in Europe should, should have parity in access or equal access to education, to transport services, and uh, to facilitate this uh, exchange. And at the same time, they envision a Europe of diverse regions in which all these regions, which can be like the national level, no? we are talking about the uh, under national level, all these regions have a particular role in this uh, machine that is the European Union, no? in, this, uh, in this territory the, of the European Union. So because of that, uh, we reach a certain level of development. And this is, this is a, a good thing because from the beginning, what they try to promote is the social and economic cohesion. And then they jump to the territorial cohesion and then they jump to the spatial planning, taking into account the diverse resources of the regions and so on. So if we translate it to this dialogue in the Latin America, well, they have many disparities. They, have, they don't have these visions of, okay, they have this market that they try to integrate, but they don't have this uh, potential because they don't have like a uh, United States uh, like uh, investing there in order to promote equality. So this concept of territorial cohesion has to do with the equality, with the equality and the parity in access to services and transportation, as I say, education, health. Um, at the end, what they try is to equal uh, the level of development. I don't know if we, I answer all the yeah. questions, but I don't know if I forgot something. No, no, I think, I think that's great. Thank you, Bella, a great response. Look, we, we've finished, but I think we've just, just got uh, one question that's been sitting there for a while. Jonathan, to you for just one minute, and uh, a second question has come in late. I might have to just read it out. Mariko Kagiyami just asked, um, where do you see indigenous often unwritten customary laws falling in today's framework of international environmental law and human rights law. If there is a conflict and tension between custom Mary law and written law or global norms, how best do you resolve that? Um, just a question that I'll read out out of respect. It just came a little bit too late, but how can we handle the clash, which is kind of related to the Mariko's comments, questions as well. How can we handle the clash between development activities state interests and environmental protection, as well as indigenous people rights. So the, both those questions, and if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free, is, is how do we deal with the clash that arises when we've got indigenous interests and rights and laws, and then uh, uh, other developments going on in a, in a uh, legal order. So a couple of minutes left before we have to finish. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question as well. And I think this is, uh, a conflict of laws uh, type of a question. Um, so on, on this one, uh, this is where I see international human rights discourse providing an answer that international environmental legal, in, international environmental law discourse does not. Um, with international human rights discourse, um, there's a principle of, um, articulated by the European Court of Human Rights. It's the margin of appreciation doctrine or the original was margin d'appreciation. Um, and so the margin of appreciation doctrine recognizes that there's variations in, uh, 
in uh, notions of rights and, and treatment of rights, but the overarching uh, guidance, um, so in other words, the margin that's allowed for variation is that there must still be some uh, protection um, and recognition of the rights of the individual. So, you know, it's in, within the human, international human rights discourse, there's sort of this limitation as to how much variation is allowed. And it's very much defined by the, the individual liberties um, represented in the ICCPR and ICESCR. Um, to my knowledge, there's nothing comparable to that doctrine with international environmental law. Um, and I think that this is something that's probably worth some kind of a discussion. Um, that doctrine, not the issue, but that the, the doctrine as a solution to the issue. So thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. A any of the other speakers have a have a response, want to respond to that? Um, all right, uh, just a, a comment in the chat room from Ben referring to a UNEP uh, project um, and he's provided a link there um, that he suggests we might be interested in and I think it looks really interesting. Thank you, Ben, for sharing that. Look, I, I don't know what the normal customary way of doing this is, but you've all been an incredibly interesting panel. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, Maria, Belen, Pamela, and Otto, particularly for those of you, I guess, who've been, who are in the middle of the night, really late, really tired. I know how hard it is because I think all of us have done some, something like this in the last couple of weeks. So a big thank you to you all. It's been a really interesting discussion and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I think hopefully our 84 participants have. Thank you, everyone. And um, just want to point out at five o'clock, which is in an hour and a half, less than an hour and a half, we have a keynote panel on transformative pathways to living in harmony with nature. Might be out of question for some of you, but I hope for those of you whose time zones work, you'll join us. So thank you again, Jonathan, Maria, Pamela, Bellen, Otto for being part of this panel. It's been wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Just say once again, thank you from my side. Uh, thank you, everyone, thank for, you. for joining, especially uh, Maria, Belen, and Pamela for <laughs> joining so early and so late. <laughs> I hope you have some good rest after this panel. And for everyone who is still in the room, don't forget to come back uh, if you can, uh, as we will we feature uh, uh, four very interesting speakers again in our uh, keynote panel uh, in one and a half an hour time. Looks great. Bye, yeah, bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.